Hello and welcome back to the Agostino Zynga Show with me, your host, Agostino Zynga, and this is episode number 499. God damn it, 499, 499 of these episodes of me ranting, raving, pontificating, chatting, absolute waffle via this microphone into your earlobes, into your speakers, and I'm grateful that you're here with me once again. I, your host, Agassino Zinger. If it's your first time, check out the show via YouTube. You know what to do. Make sure you smash the like, hit subscribe, leave me a comment down below. If you're listening via the podcast app, please leave me a five-star review or any review for that matter so people can see the show and, you know, group think they realize other people like it and then they might want to check it out too and of course support for your patrons also more than welcome to at patreon.com for just agostino for your patreon you'll get access to all my patreon content bonus only content for my patreon subscribers specifically i'm going to be uploading a story about my time going to the inner visions kind of or the arm back to back with dixon um uh, showcase that appeared at tough manor the rave i went to over the weekend so if you want to have in-depth knowledge on what i did before i went there what drugs i ordered what drinks i drank all that malarkey make sure you check out my patreon at patreon.com for just agostino for more in-depth exclusive footage and content regarding that episode check it out only available at patreon.com for just agostino you can see the description in my link on see the link in the description why do i do that you can see the link in the description click on it get registered it's only one pound equivalent of one dollar doesn't cost you that much get involved support the kid that will be greatly greatly appreciated but yeah here we are back again hope you're good wherever you may be it's been a bit of a long weekend just about recovered i'm feeling pretty good feeling pretty fine as you can tell got the vest on in that pumped ready to go still got a couple of lbs to lose but running consistently three times no running consistently at least twice a week and obviously going to the gym so things are getting where they need to get but obviously i've got ramped to running up to about three but you know we get that little by little so as i mentioned before at the top of the show loads of things to get into loads of things to discuss I'm not going to waste your time not going to drivel too much we're going to just dive on deep in it get involved in it straight away what happened over the weekend um united played west ham we won two one last minute um the gay save at the end saved our blushes but in general i think we probably deserve to win that game um especially when you consider that two of the, the christian ronaldo's um attempts to win a penalty one of which was definitely a stonewall penalty regardless if you think he tried to engineer it it was a penalty the game is the game but we didn't get it so for the gay to then finally pull out a save against one of the most consistent penalty takers in the premier league in mark noble was something that you'd only find in the history books right that's how it makes that's what makes football so brilliant the game is terrible at saving penalties and mark noble is consistently good at scoring them he comes on right at the end to take him even if he's caught coming off cold um, from the bench like some people are saying it doesn't really matter Jeremy I mean, a professional footballer um at that level should be able to score a penalty regardless right um if they're coming off cold if they just left their car right they have the requisite skills in order to make sure that they can put a ball into the net from that distance especially if that's what they're basically been put in the team for it didn't happen and then of course we won two one so over the moon for that then of course i went to the arm v back to back with dixon event that happened in tough manner courtesy of labyrinth um events who put that on great production well you real very well organized if not a tad bit underwhelming i'll mention that later as i get onto those things um but it was great to see that show great to see a very very different crowd from the, what i'm really used to from the stuff that i go to and um what's happened to the weekend that was about it really isn't it? yes but most of the weekend raving but also we can playing more playing out especially like a couple of well one gig specifically dj wise um then of course watching football and that's about it really and nothing more happened on the weekend to be completely honest um it's, it's a bit of a mad one we're fresh in the end of september um heading into october obviously it feels like i don't know we're just kind of trudging along we're not really i don't know maybe it's just me i'm not really noticing the vibes are back yet parties are back on fashion week is back especially in london right it just started this week i've seen some people on my timeline going to fashion week parties and whatnot but it doesn't feel like the energy is back in london yet i think you see pockets of energy i think when you go to when you go to shoreditch when you go to parts of county obviously to see fold when you go to parts of central east london to go to other clubs when you go to Iran cores at tottenham area and those warehouse spaces um you go to hackney wick you go to parts of lewis you go to parts of peckham new cross gate 
um i don't know where else people go and party but you go to those kind of locations and there's definitely a vibe in those pockets right people are definitely having a great time but in general it just feel like the vibes are off completely in you in the uk overall people are just kind of it feels like going through the motions and maybe it's because we don't have tourists in this country so it kind of feels a bit weird there's something missing that we probably don't take for granted that we probably take for granted or maybe it's because people have genuinely just woken up to the fact that we're not necessarily going to get out of this anytime soon right covid is, isn't gone right it was obviously people are still contracting it people are still dying um cases are where they are um, i haven't really been checking the numbers too tough but i'm pretty sure they haven't decreased drastically from what they were week from what they were like maybe a month ago right i'm sure they they reduced somewhat but not enough to say it's over with and wash our hands with so maybe that's the part of it or maybe because people just temperament wise as I noticed um, from the tough man of going to the Labyrinth um, events night, obviously over the weekend, maybe just people have, just in general, have moved on, right? And, or maybe kind of matured or changed somewhat, but something has happened. I don't know what it is. Something is definitely happening. It does feel a little bit off. I just can't put my finger in it. I don't know what it is. Again, I've been out quite often. I've been to central London. I've had dinner in places. I've gone to raves. I've gone to art galleries. I've done all the things that would put you in the proximity of strangers, right? And for sure, for sure, it feels weird. Like, I don't want anyone to say it doesn't feel weird. For sure, it does feel weird. Um, people are just not the same as before. They're not had the, I don't know. There's something missing, something weird going on. I wish I could put my finger in. I don't know if it is a consequence of directly of the pandemic or if it's a con or if it's just something that would have happened anyway we can't know that of course we're not Nostradamus but I don't know I'm noticing a real weird vibe all over the city all <laughs> for the most part I'm hoping this is going to change maybe in October because people in the UK tend to love Halloween and shit so maybe all those kind of silly parties and not taking yourself so seriously and you know having a bit of fun and drinking and p playing dress up might help people to kind of you know relax and kind of um not be so stiff but i don't know man it just feels like things have changed a little bit i don't know i don't know i, don't know. I can't put a finger on it but i did notice that over the weekend but hey what can you do so um what do i want to talk about first okay first of all i need to talk about right without putting any names on any receipts or anything and stuff as people say on the internet is it me no i say is it me I find it very difficult sometimes. I think I've done struggled with this in my life in general, which is probably one of the main reasons. Um, I say not one of the main reasons. It's the main reason. No, one of the main reasons why I think I've generally struggled to kind of get my career started in any of the ventures that I've kind of pursued in general, right? I do have an inability, or I do struggle to do the whole like networking, you know, connecting, sucking up thing mainly because i'm not very good at keeping or maintaining or growing relationships and friendships i've never been good at it right um every time I, i've broken up with a girl it's just like you know i kind of memory hole it never speak to them again um every time i kind of fall out with a friend i you know I, you might as well be an op because if i see you i'm gonna fight you sort of thing you know what i mean it's always kind of that energy with me it's never it's always kind of like in or out it's never like in the middle um and that's generally how i've kind of lived my life and again i don't necessarily go out of my way to kind of you know reach out to people and just say hang out and stuff i don't know i'm, I'm strange that way obviously if you make an effort with me i'll definitely go and reciprocate but i don't do it on my end at all i've never have done that so when you then kind of get into the creative field the entertainment field whether it's kind of what i was doing in streetwear earlier on whether i was in stores what was you know working in stores and all that stuff and doing all that kind of marketing energy type malarkey whether it's going to startups no stop not saying but yeah but you know what i mean whether it's going to the promoting side of things whether it's going to dj these sort of worlds it kind of goes without saying that you need to be well liked you need to have some level of relationships in place or relationships that you're cultivating or network that you have that you're kind of growing um in order to kind of navigate that area navigate that scene and get to where you want to get to it's a necessary evil it's a necessary thing you have to do right and it just is what it is um similar to like you know when i told one of a friend of mine who kind of went to dj um, and she was starting off and I was like, hey, have you ever considered maybe just like tapping into the, you know, 
god-given gifts that you've been given as in your two massive bazookas and maybe using them as a way to kind of get people in to what you do and then obviously once they're in the door they can be like oh shit she's actually good at what she does she's actually a sick dj because obviously this girl's really good at what she does right um one of the rare kind of proper sick female djs that plays like hip-hop r&b all that good stuff right and i mentioned i was like hey you should probably do this sort of thing and at the time she obviously gave me a weird look like oh, how dare you i'm not gonna you know subject myself or whatnot but the reality of it is that that game to be a star to be a, whatever it may be you need to have some kind of hook you need to have some kind of a piece something that you do to kind of market so especially when you're not known i think once you're known you can kind of tone it down look at the nina kairis of the lark right she's not getting into bathtubs anymore completely naked and doing an interviews with resident advisor she's kind of obviously um uh, you know did the necessary work um, in order to kind of get to a point where she can just do what she wants, right? And that's what you kind of want to get to. But it doesn't necessarily, it's not really a bad thing if you do want to use your sexuality or whatever it may be to kind of get people to pay attention to the stuff that you do. And then you'd hope that once they start paying attention, they realize, oh, you're actually good. And then from then on, you can kind of have a long term relationship, fan base, whatever it may be called, and go from there. Same thing goes for trying to navigate it the industry as a career and trying to work out where you fit in what you want to do blah 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 you just need to have that part of you in you and i've just never had that and the problem that i have in general is that sometimes i try to play that game i'll try and like this is the story i'm talking about i try to like be the nice guy who's kind of like you know trying to reach out and shit and then when i don't get the response i want it can hurt my feelings and my ego but mostly it just feels like someone's trying to big time me. I'm like, I'm not like a fan. I'm a, someone that's trying to take part. I'm someone that's doing my own thing. I'm somebody that obviously feels like my voice and my sound is going to be necessary. And I'm just doing this because I'm a genuine fan. And sure, right? It's comes coming from a fan base point of view, but it's also coming from somebody that wants to be uh, an integral part of what's going on here, right? In the future going forward. So to see people kind of big time you and kind of give you the cold shoulder a little bit, it can get a little bit annoying and frustrating and it can make you hate the person, hate the establishment they represent and maybe swear off never going there again. But I don't want to do that. So what I'm going to do as a kind of lesson overall is just not do that anymore not bother reaching out and instead do what people should be doing for the most part should be focusing on which is number one just getting really good at what you do really good at the craft hone your craft be undeniable so that all the other stuff won't really matter now it's really difficult to do that because if you had to choose between you know um objectifying yourself in whichever way that would kind of allow you to get through the door whether it's you you know using your sex appeal your race your gender whatever i don't care using it as a kind of as a crowbar to kind of crack the door open and then obviously using your talent to kind of slip in fair enough if you had to choose between sex um objectifying yourself um creating a network um yeah objectifying yourself sucking up to people let's say in general to get in or just making sure that you're really tan you're really good at what you do, like working on your craft, spending two hours a day practicing free for um, showcasing your work, all that good stuff, right? What's the hardest thing of those three? For sure, the hardest thing, in my opinion, is the, is the last one, right? Making sure that you're actually good at what you do, because you know, objectifying yourself, especially if you've got like an interesting thing to objectify yourself, which is in vogue at the moment, race, gender, sexuality, um, what you look like, right? All that stuff is easy to do because it's in vogue and everyone does it. Cool, that can work. Sucking up to people is annoying and people t try to tell you that it doesn't work. But let's be honest, it does. We know a lot of people. I know a lot of people who've kind of got in through the door. And again, it's not just what it, a lot of people mis mistake this sort of thing. You don't have a career because you suck up to people you have a career because that's how it let you to get, that's what allowed you to get into the door it allowed you to get into certain rooms it allowed your name to be mentioned around certain people that's what you do to suck up right and then you hope once you suck up that your work that you can showcase once you're in there will be good enough to kind of kind of give you a position there for good that's why people say the whole term fake it to make it fake it to make it doesn't necessarily mean scamming people and showing them pretending you can do one thing while not doing it if, if essentially fake it to make it is like hey i'm gonna say that i can do this thing but then when it comes to the time of you analyzing whether i can do it, i'm going to use that time in between to learn how to do it and i'm hoping me showcasing what i can learn in two weeks is enough to get me the job right but it's not completely flying getting someone to do the work for you and then presenting it not trying to learn it on your own no 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 the fake it to make it means i'm gonna lie that i can do photoshop design in my interview 
in the hopes that what the challenge they give me, I can figure it out the, the, um, in the time before I'm meant to hand it in so that then I can get a good crack of maybe showing myself up at the flipping interview and whatnot, right? And, and basically displaying my, um, what you call it? My uh, willingness to learn and to grow in that role. That's what basically it's for. So I don't know. It's just for me, most of it's just a realization. Or did I get like I just can't do it? Do you know what I mean? And it just it gets it makes me angry, pisses me off, all that kind of sucking up stuff, and I just start getting pissed. And in general, that's not a, a kind of um, worthwhile or constructive emotion. And I think in general, more time should be spent on just getting good at your work, crafting things, and and you know being undeniable in that way. I think I read, you know, stoic philosophy a lot and you think to yourself, like, why aren't there people around nowadays who think as clearly and rationally as these people? And of course, most of it has to do with the fact that life has moved on. Modern society, we've got too many distractions. People are spending way too much time on social media, way too much time arguing about nonsense things, way too much time buying stuff, way too much time consuming nonsense bits of content like myself. And they're not spending enough time really kind of pontificating and thinking about the rigors of life. And obviously work takes, you know, priority, family takes priority, friends take priority. You just, you know, there's no time to think about the importance of life or what it means to be honorable what it means to be trustworthy you know what it means to be loyal and all this sort of stuff right there's no there's no time to think about those kind of things but you would imagine that your life would be far richer if you could and your life would be far more fulfilling or you or you would feel far more fulfilled in your career if you could just focus on the work right forget the marketing forget the networking forget all that stuff and the hustle side of things just focus on being really good at what you do and of course just making sure that you display that right and obviously you've got platforms like twitter facebook um instagram where you can basically um create content and put that on your feed that illustrates who you are as a person and more importantly if you're creative it illustrates the things that you can do the vision that you have your sound um your perspective all these things can easily be displayed on there so there if anything there really is no reason for you to be reaching out and as i've included i'm speaking to myself for this there is no reason for you, there really no is no reason for you to be reaching out to people unless it's you come to a point where you think okay and again you know when you know it it's sort of like when you do two a days in a gym people will say oh yeah how do you know what days to take off your body will tell you you'll try and wake up or you'll try and go to the bathroom and it'll feel like you know you're sinking in quicksand and then you realize probably it's not a good idea to go and squat today do you know what i mean um same thing happens for knowing when to reach out to somebody when you've maybe done all the work you've done all the practice you'll know when it's right you'll know when the right time is and usually the right time isn't now for most people usually the right time is far later down the line when you've actually done the work and that's skin myself included but i had to kind of realize that the other day um, I had a bit of a, an interaction that I didn't necessarily like and I was like alright cool I'm not going to do this anymore and I don't want to hate this place because again I don't want to hate these people because you know it's my issue it's not theirs and again don't know me so it is what it is but from my perspective I just don't think it's necessary energy to do to waste your time messaging people contacting people reaching out to people it's just not it's not worth it it just isn't you just rather just get good at what you do become undeniable you know display passion display ingenuity creativity um whatever it may be and then hopefully that resonates with people and then they can then and then from then on it can take you to the place it needs to go because if i think about my career and the various things that i've done over my life the times that i've felt like okay cool i'm finally getting somewhere has always co corresponded with with times where i'm working really hard and i'm doing the work diligently and then a chance encounter happens to kind of cross my path, right? The universe speaks to me. The Lord above blesses me with something. It always happens that way. Very un. It's in my whole entire life of working, it's never happened where I've kind of just been dormant. I've been sedentary, and then somebody's come up to me and given me a flipping Willy Wonka ticket. Do you know what I mean? It doesn't happen like that. It's usually you working hard, and then all of a sudden chance and luck comes your way, grace, blessings, whatever it may be called, and then the kind of you know. And then from then off, of course, it's your, it's your kind of, you know, um, this it's your it's in your hands to kind of make that deal work. But usually that's what ends up happening. So focus on the work, focus on the work, focus on the work, ship, 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 you know, of course, showcase and ship everything that you do and worry about the and networking with that stuff later. Because all these same people that are big timing you and trying to act like Billy, B Billy Big Balls, the moment you are, the moment you are worth caring about, they will want to care about you, which is, again, shallow and gross. But the game is the game, isn't it? It's no need to be bitter about it and all that stuff it just is what it is similar again to what i said about my friend about you know maybe showcasing her big bazookas on the social media feed especially if you're on a dj just because it's going to people locked into you it's un it's un it, it, you don't want to tell that to somebody especially especially someone you think is a friend um but 
unfortunately that is the game and it's ha it has showcased that it has it, it kind of has shown that it does work right over the years we've seen many examples where it does work and um that is basically what i've been thinking about over the weekend i was like ah but yeah maybe i'm in the wrong maybe i'm thinking about it all differently but if you disagree or you agree let me know your thoughts and opinions in the comments down below i'd love to know your response so let's talk about this briefly yeah because i was there just the other day so um obviously over the weekend i went to labyrinth events um labyrinth sorry events night at toff manor or day festival not night day festival at toff manor starring arm dixon back to back jimmy jules um jennifer cardini dj holographic um who else was there I forgot, but yeah, whatever. Loads of really great people playing there. Um, all day festival starts at what midday, goes on to about half ten, in the middle of Bedfordshire, just outside of London. Maybe like two like two hours, an hour and a half outside London. It took us about two hours to get there, but a story for another day. And um, a fairly immersive, secluded, um, really great and really well produced, put together event that, if anything, maybe showcased how versatile and um um yeah yeah, so yeah it showcases how versatile labyrinth are in terms of a promotional outfit right because we've been to a few of their events we've gone to an event in mixed garage that was tricks playing we went to the gerd jansen event at love studios and we also went to the todd church at love studios too so we've seen them putting an event on in mixed garage right which is a really cool trendy little warehouse um storage space where they put beers and stuff and that's now been kind of taken over by another club called the color factory but we saw them putting an event on in a very kind of um bare bones warehouse space in hackney wick we saw them put on a very cool sort of a little bit more fancy event in loft studios in northwest london and then we then saw them do a real festival -y kind of event one day of course in the middle of bedfordshire on a site that hosts like an amazing um regal sort of mansion home thing right so we saw them do all these three different events and each one has been really well produced really well put together um again great organization everything that you could need from loose to toilet security guards welfare attendants um drinks dr um food kiosks there's about four there pizza ice cream van there was a great little chill out bar towards the back where the main stage was where you could just basically chill in this little circle weird little shape thing right and i guess like a labyrinthy type thing um and then there was but there was there's like a tree with logs underneath it you could chill under too which i'd imagine would be amazing if you're tripping off lsd or something like again really well produced they had coaches picking up people from various stations around london to go directly to the venue or you could take transport there yourself they were sending us emails annoying ones don't get me wrong every single day telling us exactly where it needs to be which again you know they kind of over they in and over inundated us with information but still very very well done very well produced if anything i'd say it's a tad on underwhelming just for myself because i, I felt like at the, the space it was i felt like they could have gone a little bit more harder in terms of how they um tried to, <clears throat> they could have a lot, a lot more harder in terms of the sound specifically especially on the main stage and more so on the other stage to the right um the sound was terribly low um it could have been a lot more immersive especially for the space or especially for the area that they were in there's no point of going that far outside london if you're just going to have it sound and kind of feel like any other festival in victoria park now again it was very well done don't get me wrong but it still didn't really blow you away as much as it probably should have and again it's hard to do but i get what i mean but the stage was very well done i thought everything around it was cool but it just could have been a little bit more i think it was just they just played it a bit too safe maybe because of the first one i'm not too sure but still i think it was a bit too safe no, so what is the first one, I guess, on that site? I don't know if it was the first one ever, but I think it's the first one maybe on that site. I think they played it maybe a bit too safe that way overall. And um, yeah, that's that was maybe, And again, my biggest grab again, the journey. I think they definitely overstated how short the journey would be. Um, it was definitely much longer. Um, it took us about two hours to get there. Um, the, the, the day kind of started off a bit rough because we had a very annoying person sitting next to us on the coach who was quite possibly one of the worst persons to have ever kind of graced the same day festival and you really have to question people's sanity for going to such event if you have such a stinky attitude you know this person arrived on the bus first of all sat at the back where you know most of the troublemakers are going to sit right let's just say that and then decided to kind of put their bag on the chair seat so no one else could sit on it 
And of course, the bus filled up very quickly. Again, at the time we were on the bus, no one was on it, fair. By the time we got on it, it turned into a party bus very quickly. So if you were somebody that was going to a day festival like that on your own, you would probably want to just sit next to the front so you could just kind of avoid all the nonsense, right? So you could just limit all the, uh, you know, unnecessary talking, people, you know, trying to walk to, to, to the toilets and leaning on you and all that stuff. You just want to avoid it. Number one, anyway, I wouldn't go to a festival like that on my own on a bus, bus that's taking me from London to the venue. I'd probably want to make my own way there, especially if I was going there sober. I wouldn't want to be around drunk people at all. But yeah, that's a story for another day. This person gets on a bus, puts their coach, their, their, the coach, sorry, puts their chair or their bag on the chair. People start filling in and then you'd imagine at that point you'd want to swap and go to the front they don't they just sit there and then when people are trying to sit down that seat rudely say no which i've never seen before in my entire life on the coach like no you just put your bag at the top because there's space there doesn't want to move the bag cool then we get to the venue and they get off the bag they get off the venue they get off the bus you know angry like you know stone-faced walked walk right in front of us and obviously make it known that i'm here with the event organizers and trying to get into the back area just you know, a complete wanker and then by the time we got our raving and we're on the next to the main stage guess who we see out on the stage taking pictures and shit this person do you know what i mean just a t terrible and i think that may have put me off the off my kind of game in general I'm not really sure because i was just kind of i was bewildered i was like why would someone like that come to an event like this like, why would you bring such a horrible attitude to such a great and joyous event it just doesn't make any sense but i guess you know, everyone's got their thing and maybe i kind of set the tempo a bit off then <laughs> maybe i kind of set things off on the bad foot anyway because when that person did kind of arrive at the coach and asked about you know going to the store before the coach leaves i did make an innocuous joke about yeah get me something to or something and it didn't land well let's just say so you know this, this person doesn't necessarily respond that well to humor from strangers which is fine because no one should be responding to anyone from strangers if you don't know somebody you don't need to give them a response bloody blah, blah 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 all that safe stuff but still that might have just set things off weirdly but regardless of that horrible and you know nonsense person um the rest of the crowd was pretty awesome I've got to be honest maybe one of the best raving crowds i've seen in a long time and definitely gave me um uh good vibes and an appreciation for the kind of uniqueness of london club now because i think sometimes if you go to places that fold and cause often like i do or like i did prior to the pandemic you can be forgiven to think everywhere in london is the same which is not especially crowd wise not everyone's decked out in all black wearing double decker flipping dr martins some people i don't know are wearing a white shirt some people are wearing funky shirts as they would prefer of those oh those funky shirts honestly whoever's whoever's still wearing these that outfit that people wear in festivals where you wear jean shorts or some sort of really tight short white socks you know some sort of scuffy shoes and a really loud shirt like a hawaiian shirt any kind of shirt with a print on it please stop enough's enough like that and also the girl version of the outfit is basically those yoga flare pants things that girls are wearing right that make your bum look amazing of course i understand why girls want to wear it because even if you got a flat ass it makes you look like you don't have one it looks like it makes you look like you got a bit of a bounce in there i get the need to wear it but everyone has those flipping pants on it's just annoying right so just saw all of that but still it was nice to see color it was nice to see again apart from i think when we went me and my friend went it was just only us probably wearing all black everyone else was wearing color so that was great to see and the ages too that was nice different ages like it went from i would say 18 to maybe 67 right the guy that was dancing with at the bit uh, for a bit at the, at the front of the stage that was refreshing and just the sounds in general right the the, the kind of audio tapestry that um innovations crew are able to weave it's just nice it's just unique um you get like a real sort of um blend of genres everything from deep house to house to melodic house um to tech house to kind of more electro -y type stuff um there's a tinge of maybe electronic body music like all these really cool sounds that kind of don't go together but do go together disco that feel amazing when they put on the night so it's a far more in my opinion interesting um kind of listening experience to go to than your standard techno part which i obviously still like but i like the kind of going to a festival where literally every dj has their own unique sound right in terms of what they're able to kind of bring to the table so that was brilliant um so overall a decent event um i'll play a couple of clips from um to dixon instagram page that basically captures most of the event and what was going on um let me see if i can get it up here ba, 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 ba. let's move on where is it is it working yet okay, let's go here there let's play some videos actually from the event it's because you have arm to dixon page oh, 
I think two things were playing at the same time there. Let me just start that one again. Let's start that one again. I think two things are playing at the same time, right? I'm pretty sure. Do, 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 do. Let's go again. This needs to come out ASAP, by the way. in it you get the vibe <sighs> anyway great 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 again great event big up labyrinth for putting it on uh big up everyone i saw there in attendance um everyone that we bumped into new friends and old friends i think that's one of the greatest things about the little innovations community that exists on social media with the innovations lovers on the facebook page and obviously this arm to dixon page here on instagram there's a real great um community that surrounds it everyone seems really cool and blessed we bumped into a couple of people that we've seen at previous events and hopefully some more we'll see in others um next event i think is tricks coming up in october 22nd or something around those kind of mark so if um if people are going to be at that then make sure you say hi holler at the kid but yeah big up everyone we bumped into everyone we saw great event or overall again a tad underwhelming for me just in terms of where it was and what it could have been but maybe we're going to see better brighter things from them and maybe pushing the envelope a little bit more from labyrinth maybe going forward but yeah enjoyed it enjoyed it very very much next on the list i was thinking to talk about this is kind of maybe relating a little bit to what i was going to speak about later concerning the balenciaga and Fortnite thing that's happening at the moment now they've got a collab they just launched um digital only sort of you know an immersive collab similar to what probably i'm assuming they did with travis scott and people are losing their minds over on social media because you know every time balenciaga releases a product that goes viral people are reminded of how insane the fashion prices are in general right which has always been the fact in it because you know you could buy probably i don't know there was a time when let's think about it let's sort of think of a low hanging fruit maybe like a coin purse or something from a fashion brand have always been severely overpriced compared to stuff that you'd get from a normal shop right it just is what it is what it is so people i guess always reminded about how gross the prices are of balenciaga when they do collaborations but in general it gets a bit annoying that whole discourse because mostly the people that are getting more that again their knickers and a twist about it are usually the fashion purists who don't necessarily buy the stuff that they talk about anyway they just complain about it but they don't buy it and the consumers that do care about it don't talk about it on social media they just go and buy it and enjoy it and um an accurate thing or something i thought was kind of similar to this is this where i just checked out on billboard top one or the yeah the billboard top 10 of hip-hop and r&b records right and this is more in tune with what people have been talking about on social mostly about the drake album being crap and then the Kanye album being better, which, you know, I could understand and kind of agree with. I still think there's no point comparing both eyes. I think they're completely different in what they do. They bring completely different things to music, which is why they both sold incredibly the amount, incredible amounts still first week. I think, you know, Kanye still did 351. I think first week Drake did, I think, 600 and 50 something first week so it's not like they don't have fans they clearly have fans who love what they do and will buy it no matter what kanye flipping you know delayed the release by four months by like a month sorry right or, or maybe more than that right um and and played it out loud in four to people in the stadium two times and people have got rips of it i've got rips of it on my on my phone um drake delayed the release of his album three times maybe two times and it still sold that much so people they've obviously got fans they don't care about all the nonsense discourse on social but on social media you'll be forgiven to think that again kanye is far out you know stripping um drake in terms of the quality music is making or the 
the appeal that it has for people. I say quality because Billboard's not a quality uh, chart, but in the terms of the appeal and how it resonates with people, you would assume Kanye is the one that's the lead favorite and, and Drake's not. But if you look at the top 10 in Billboard, right? There's not one Kanye track on there from the entire album. Not even Hurricane. Hurricane, I think, comes in the 11. Yeah, Hurricane's at 11, which is the most kind of, I guess, palatable track on Donda. Um, that one's featuring uh, The Weeknd and Little Baby, right? A heavenly track. But not one other track from that album features in the top 10, despite what everyone tells you online, that they think the Kanye album is better than the Drake album. The actual opinion of people in the real, well, not in real life, but the actual opinion, um, actions of people don't actually match up what they say on social media which is not a surprise I think people know this about social media but it's just interesting that this happens in this case because I think this is a accurate representation of people wanting to be cool and not like Drake because it's easy not to like him because he's a bit corny right but then they want to like Kanye because he's a bit controversial and he's a little bit more quote-unquote artistic right in the conventional sense a little bit more avant-garde a little bit more out of the box thinking in terms of what he does that it may be seeming a little bit more not counterculture because you know you can't like someone that sells three hundred fifty thousand copies first week and hosts a dope flipping listening parties in football stadium and think it's counterculture right of course not and it's decked out in ten thousand pound in ten thousand pounds or thousands of pounds worth of gear but still because he's like the you know the villain everyone wants to hate it makes more sense to say kanye's album is better but again people are voting with their ears people are voting with their streams and they're still saying that drake's music still resonates with them better than anything else and you know this way too sexy track is just absolutely ripping it up in the charts um two weeks now at number one um i think it's future's first number one when you consider everything else that he's put together flipping knife talk which i think may be one of the poorest tracks on the album is number two obviously you got Lil Nas S um doing his thing there girls want girls for fair trade um champagne party no friends in the industry into the yeah, my favorite track on it in the bible is on number 14 but it's absolutely wild isn't it to think what's happening with these people which are what people actually listen to as opposed to what they say on social media so i guess that's why i think in general i think when it comes to music or in anything i think i believe in just kind of listening to things and having your own opinion about what's going on about what you like what you don't like and try maybe to articulate it to yourself whether you write in a blog writing in a journal sending out tweets recording an instagram video doing a podcast like i'm doing it doesn't matter try and maybe articulate why you specifically like something and why it resonates with you and then maybe try and find other musicians other artists other bands other movements whatever it may be that kind of um are similar to the stuff that you like in this person that could maybe get you interested in other things going forward and i think in general that can that would maybe foster a much more nuanced and aware not nuanced and aware a much more informed um and kind of a little bit more higher of a taste level in terms of the consumer that listens to music in general because i think that might be part of the reason right people are just kind of saying stuff to say stuff but they don't necessarily have any real taste in anything i mean it's just whatever they see on social they listen to it, latch onto it and they latch off if it's not too cool i don't really know i'm not too sure but yeah it's just interesting to see as an analysis that everything people say on social isn't what they actually do in real life and how they respond with their with their feet and with their monies and with their streams and with their play buttons and with their streaming services they listen to what they listen to and the charts you know accurately um portray that of course most of it is a bit skewed because the biggest artists are going to get the biggest budgets so it's going to drastically kind of improve their chances of finishing higher in the charts bloody blah, blah 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 i know but still you know it is what it is let's move on what else do we want to talk about here yeah let's go at this briefly so i'm not going to put nothing on the screen because again i just think it's a little bit yeah you know meh but um if you're not familiar with this i've talked about this a few times on my um podcast in general and on this channel um dark side phil right the legendary and much maligned um you you know game streamer who a lot of people tend to really dislike myself included mostly because of his kind of you know toxicity levels the fact that he's a blatant liar scammer and the fact that he begs on stream right for money from strangers is just always gonna you know kind of make me feel uneasy even though he says it's crowdfunding and he doesn't have any corporate sponsors and the fact that trolls have ruined his business is why he has to beg but still it's always gonna be gross to see a grown man who has all his capabilities has no real limiting factor that can't allow him not to work sitting on stream and 
begging for tips. It's just always going to be gross. It's never going to not be good. It's never not going to be palatable. It's never not going to be agreeable. It's going to be gross. Cool. No problem. Move on. The developments happened over the last couple of weeks or last couple of days specifically has been that a large army, well, not a large army, um, one particular person, I think one particular person managed to socially engineer their way into getting a hold of Darkseid Phil's banking records. And essentially what they've revealed is that all of the claims that he used to say prior that he didn't have any money, that all the money that he was receiving from tips was going directly to pay bills and that he couldn't afford to improve his set up in terms of streaming. He couldn't get a green screen. He couldn't update stuff on. He couldn't update, you know, his computer hardware things. Everything had to be donated by fans. Um, he's living check by check. All this sort of nonsense things that people just didn't really understand or agree with. Mostly because people had a very aware and acute understanding of how streaming and all that stuff works and they kind of were able to surmise that he was making a certain base rate and then it was able to add all the tips that he was getting because obviously it was public available information because he put it up on his leaderboard and whatnot um and on the stream on the banner on the top and whatnot right people were able to kind of surmise that no this guy's getting easily and this is before he got kicked off of twitch there was a surmise you know this guy's clearly getting close to 10 grand per month his bills only come up to maybe a quarter of that or maybe just above a uh, half that's still five grand a month that he has in his pocket that he's somehow blowing and but every day that he's getting on stream he needs to make 150 or 100 dollars to 200 dollars per stream and he does two streams per day which is obscene amounts of money that he's making if he's able even to cross half of that right it just didn't make any sense and i guess that was mainly his main issue it wasn't the fact that he was begging for tips which again i have a problem with the fact that he was begging for tips under the guise that he was poor he was poor right he's feigning kind of poverty essentially is what people had a real problem with and people kind of made it their you know life's work to uncover it and somebody finally did uncover it right they socially engineered their way into dsp's bank which of course is gross which of course is identity theft which of course is a federal crime which of course will get you in a bit of trouble and i'm not meant to like it but in general, I think there needs to be an understanding or an acceptance or willingness to speak kind of candidly and openly about people doing gross things and having gross things happen to them and having no reaction to it. Not celebration or jubilation, just having no reaction and being uh, and kind of somewhat being allowed to be, you know, uh, nonplussed that they're also getting fucked with in this way. I think of a story I saw the other day about wendy williams right the talk show host who's allegedly going through some health complications now supposedly suffers from covid supposedly there was drinking problems loads of stuff's happening at the moment right but she's clearly somebody that kind of suffers a lot from some you know malign malign malignant medical issues whatever it may be now it could be argued i would say myself like she's an incredibly gross person right she gets on air and essentially airs out people's you know private information or private health or private relationship things that people things that people shouldn't and don't need to know she kind of puts it out there in general in an under in a way to kind of denigrate and to put down people in general she's done that for the most of her career that's her stick that's why she got that wendy williams show which is incredible that somebody actually got that show um in order to kind of sit there on live tv and essentially um deride people celebrities included um for the decisions that they make it's just horrible but it is what it is. Some would say that's, you know, karma coming back to bite you in the ass, right? The fact that you're going through what you're going through. It doesn't happen all the time. Some some of the grossest people in the world just kind of tend to just get away with it. But it's interesting to see that this happening to Phil at this point. But it's also interesting to see the after effects of it have been that, of course, people have been able to get dig through some of the banking documents and statements and were able to surmise that he's spending thousands of dollars on WWE champions even though he was saying that he wasn't playing this game which is basically a gambling game which has led to him spending massive amounts of microtransactions I think somewhere I saw like thousands he was spending per week on this microtransactions the fact that he eats out a ton even though he, says he doesn't have money to buy to go and take his wife out for food or whatnot. just crazy shit right so essentially lying intentionally about his whole financial position because of course he's addicted to gambling and of course he's addicted to to alcohol it looks like right there was i think a 400 and 400 dollar a month bill for gin so he's cra spending crazy he's doing crazy stuff and again no one's it should be no one's business what he does with his money 
especially the money his fans are willingly giving to him, but they're willingly giving to him under the guise that he's suffering and he's kind of destitute and he doesn't have any money and that if he doesn't get tips, he won't be able to buy groceries, right? It's, that's what they're thinking. But instead, he's actually got a DoorDash membership. He's ordering two times per day sometimes. He's going out to Starbucks to get things. You know, things that you wouldn't get if you're obviously financially destitute and in a tough post spot. You just wouldn't. You just buy, eat, drink coffee at home. You just, which is what it is. You can't spend five pounds in a coffee shop because you just don't have that five pound and it's not a financially um sensible decision to make financially simple decision to make right but then it also got me thinking in general about scumbag people making it on social media and being really popular and i think there definitely is something in the fact that it doesn't really pay and it doesn't really necessarily give you there is obviously some examples out there but in large part in order to kind of gain massive fan bases and to maybe curtail that into a business or even to kind of have a really short stint where you get viral for something and then you kind of fizzle out. You need to be somewhat toxic. You need to be somewhat disagreeable, somewhat annoying, um, somewhat, maybe you have to, to have a punchable face, annoying voice, um, uh, disgusting things that you do, right? There needs to be something kind of like, quote unquote, gross, to make you intriguing enough for people to kind of decide from all the other content creators that exist on social media um, that you're the person that they're going to follow for good or bad, right? It kind of feels like that because like, I, don't, I can't necessarily think of many good people who, like I mean good people, like good honest people, I'm sure they exist, but not making kind of the monies and the kind of having the virality and the relevancy of someone like a dog. So if it been in this game, what, 10 plus years, right? continually annoying people like myself online for 10 plus years and having no real life consequences arrive at his doorstep and somehow still have fans kind of still willingly um and kind of enthusiastically giving you money even with these bank deal leaks right i think i've seen a couple of the streams so far highlights of them and he's still been able to for the most part hit his tips goals um and a couple of the streams of course but the support is still there it's not like it's dried up and it's gone back to zero no it never has he's still getting great support people are still kind of showing up and watching them and contributing to chats and whatnot even though they they run like a flipping north korea but i just don't understand it i really don't i don't get it um i guess a lot of people maybe some of the fans might argue and say hey we always knew he was lying about what he was um his kind of financial position but we're just we just like him as a person we're willing to give him the money regardless fair do what you want with your money but it's just a crazy situation to be in, isn't it? Imagine being that hated that people want to socially engineer a way to get into your bank deals to sh prove to everybody that, hey, you get way more money than you're letting on and you're also spending an insane amount on stuff, on stuff that you shouldn't be if you're in the position that you say you are. Um, and you obviously lie about your spending habits, right? Because he clearly would do that and you would always kind of be vague about where he goes and stuff and you say because it was the security of his family and you want people to you know call him bombface where he was going but the honest truth was that he didn't want people to kind of google the spots that he was going on going to and figure out that he was spending a hundred dollars on sushi when just the other day on on stream he was saying that he can't afford um you know electricity in his home like it just doesn't make any sense so yeah big up dark side feel i guess like it's a, obviously a terrible situation to go through to have your addictions be basically placed on front street like that but again i can't say it's not deserving i can't say karma didn't arrive to his doorstep finally um for some part obviously the truth is out there and i think in general for the distractors i think most people from what i've been reading especially on kiwi farms they seem to be content enough with the banking deals being leaked they don't want anything to go any further they're just content enough that they're not the ones crazy because that's what um, dsp would do he would gaslight people and say oh you guys are um, you know you're the same people that believe that Trump won the election, all this sort of stuff. Like, obviously, this is not true. I didn't do this. I didn't do that. Like, you'd obviously just gaslight you in that way, right? Um, but now those banking deals basically prove what everyone was saying was right. He gets far more money than he's letting on. His spending habits are obscene. And again, this is this is somebody that doesn't have a drug problem. He just, um, obviously, you could say um, gambling is a drug. But he's not like he's buying coke and heroin and shit. He's just spending insane amounts of money on you know, WWE champions, which is basically a candy crush um, with a WWE skin over it. And then he's also spending insane amounts on what, what was it? WWE champions was the main one. And I think food and going and, and basically gin, right? Eating out or ordering in and gin. 
Like that's the majority of where his money's going to. And he's just staying indoors for the most part. It's just like, I don't know, man. I don't get it, man. What a bizarre human being, but you know, it is what it is. Um, I guess he will figure it out or he won't. It is what it is. We move on. Um, this is an interesting kind of topic. This is courtesy of Hip Hop DX. There's been this massive debate happening on social media, or massive, you know, on my corner of social media on a timeline where people have been arguing um, whether or not um, Drake is a far bigger star um, than Michael Jackson or if he's comparable to Michael Jackson. And this is a headline here. Billboard sets off Drake and Michael Jackson debate with numbers to back it up. Um, Drake certified lover boy has already asserted its dominance of the charts, topping the Billboard 200 of this year's biggest sales, 613 units, and Spotify's streaming debut of 743.7 million on demand streams. Oh my god! While claiming nine of the top 10 spots in Billboard Top 100. While much of the build up of uh, certified lover boy's September release saw Drake pitted against Kanye West, who released his new album, the album Donda, least a uh, week before. The enormous success of the Toronto rapper's late efforts to drink in comparison to even more rarefied music legend on saturday billboard posted a tweet posted this question is drake in 2021 now as big as and uh, now as big as michael jackson or the beatles at their peak let's look at the, some of the factors behind drake's incredible chart incredible sorry incredible chart blow um for one um drake's um certified lover boy for mentioned nine top 10 hits means drake has more has broken more michael jackson records for the most billboard top 100 oh let's go back again so if I love a boy's aforementioned nine top 10 hits means that Drake has broken Michael Jackson's record for the most billable top one hot 100 top 10s for the same album Cool. previously MJ's 982 blockbuster Thriller posted seven songs in the top 10 a feat that stood for 70 37 years right insane god damn Drake also outranks Michael Jackson in terms of most number ones top, top 10 of the MJ's six um, most top 10 singles 54 to MJ's 30 and most consecutive weeks on the billboard top 100 40, 443 and most hot 100 entries period 258 however Michael Jackson still reigns supreme over Drake when it comes to the most consecutive number one singles five to Drake's two um, Thriller means Fino Thriller means, remains the best selling album of all time with a reported 100 million copies sold worldwide that album came out in 1982 didn't it Thriller god damn it um, it continues needless to say Billboard will tweet itself in passionate debate between Drake and Michael Jackson's respective fans as they compared the six gods record breaking run in the king of pop's enduring popularity so my opinion on this, right? We threw a couple people too. Anyway, oh, my hay fever's playing up there. Um, interesting debate. I think it's worth mentioning. I think it's worth debating because I do think we do have a tendency nowadays to not give people their flowers whilst they're around. And we do have a tendency to kind of poo-poo our current icons, our current musical geniuses, our current creative, artistic, whatever geniuses. And, and give them the props that they deserve we kind of look at the history books with rose tinted article with rose tinted spectacles but we don't give the people that are doing stuff now and putting their you know their kind of creativity on the line or their work and showcasing it and kind of performing and proving year in year out we don't give them the adulation that they need to deserve but on the other side of it i do kind of hate when people compare people all the time like this and i do also did hate it when people kind of say this person is a modern day that person i remember one time somebody doing it during when virgil i think maybe got appointed louis vuitton creative director um for men's and somebody on social was like oh yeah i think to post the picture of him with somebody i don't know where it was somebody else that you know some wanky person is like oh these people are the modern day malcolm x or something like that and it's like what like i get that you're friends and stuff but that just doesn't make any sense and also that's dumb do you know what i mean um but again i understand the i understand the premise right I, we have to give people their flowers whilst they're here they're showing improving every single year why not compare them to these people just because you know it's nowadays why is it gross why is it cringe i get it i understand but there needs to be an honest conversation about what we're comparing we're comparing numbers that are overly inflated because of the streaming era obviously because of the internet and we have to also compare and put into contrast just how electrifying stars and icons like richard no, sorry like, like uh, michael jackson david bowie prince the beatles you know i don't know name some more 
at their heyday how they actually were and the kind of fever pitch um around them that existed it's just something that you don't, you don't really see replicated nowadays it just isn't a thing i don't know why that is i don't know what the case is i don't know what the case may be i think i was reminded about it a little bit it's a weird example but i saw a video of Nicki minaj performing at um what festival was it recently no, it wasn't recently. It was an old video of her performing at Made in America or something like that, right? Um, and you forget just how many hit songs this woman has. And you also forget the fact that she's a supreme lyricist, a supreme rapper, right? Really, really up there in terms of her ability to write rhymes. Isn't a dancing kind of girl, right? Can just barely two-step. Even if she's is Caribbean, she's not the most um, sensualist of dancers and stuff, right? But she commands a stage, has great hit records, and can perform her ass off, right? Like, great. And again, this is for somebody that probably spent her whole time, especially during her peak, Nicki Minaj was touring around Europe and, of course, the UK a lot. So her ability to perform on a stage is undeniable. But then you compare it to the people that people tell you are the next big thing nowadays, like the Megan Thee Stallions, the City Girls, all these kind of people, they're just not the same calibre. Yeah, maybe they got the attention now because social media's progressed since Nicki Minaj started. Social media wasn't even around or internet wasn't around in the way that it is when Michael Jackson was around. So of course your ability to kind of put yourself out there and make the numbers f make you look like you should be in a conversation with said person are there. But in terms of artistic sort of impact, in terms of cultural impact, in cultural legacy, in terms of just what you see with your eyes and what you can feel in your soul, you know that just this just isn't right. It just doesn't make sense, right? You've seen videos amongst just some performing places and people legitimately fainting into the arms of security guards. That isn't normal. That isn't something that just can be replicated through streaming numbers. That obviously is a once in a lifetime situation that we probably won't see rectified. I, I don't think we'll, I don't agree with people who say we're never going to see a talent as great as Michael Jackson because I do think in the future there will be somebody of course it's going to come around i think it's just the way the world works um there's going to always going to be somebody that pops around it's just kind of remind you how beautiful music is and why you fell in love with going to see live shows and whatnot and i think that person will ha you know again um will kind of come out of the ether somewhere somewhere or the other but let's not let's not kind of uh skew things right let's be honest Drake's an amazing artist. He does incredible things. He's obviously somebody who's been able to kind of sympathize and capture the cultural zeitgeist. He is a master at providing you for tracks and songs and lyrics and bars and hooks for the moment that you're living in. Um, but let's also be honest, he's nowhere near in terms of what Michael Jackson was able to do artistically, creatively, legacy-wise, performance-wise. He's nowhere near Kanye. He's nowhere near, Kanye. He's nowhere near Drake. Drake is not any Mark Jackson. It just is the fact of the matter. Um, again, he need, Drake. Give, you can get, you can give Drake his flowers without denigrating the legacy of Michael Jackson by comparing him to Drake, especially considering how long Michael Jackson's run was, especially considering the legacy that he left, especially considering just him as a person overall, especially considering the, the content that exists out there that we could see of what kind of reaction he used to get when he used to be out there in the streets don't get me wrong if Drake was to walk down on Oxford Street I'm sure he would shut it down too but this is just a different level of stardom that exists with these people that you just don't see and again I don't know what it is maybe it's because of the prevalence of social media and the fact that we see these people too often maybe or maybe the way the, way the media works I don't know or stand culture I don't know what it is but we are missing a lot of artists especially in music who have the it factor who have the x factor which is why people are so obsessed with people like rihanna and stuff right because not many of those people exist right they're able to kind of just hold your attention no matter what they're doing um they're able to kind of <coughs> resonate with people from all walks of life it just doesn't exist the way it did in the past and i don't know why but i guess it's just the case so let's roll back down and see some responsible people on social um coach of hip-hop dx it has here um someone said the fact that you have to compare him to Michael Jackson speaks to itself he is a blueprint the world will never experience the amount of star power Michael Jackson had and I think this is a performance match just jump him we're going to play it though because probably get copyright strike another person here says you can try to push this narrative all day long but nope and they have images of Michael Jackson's um kind of waving to fans and crowds adoring crowds you know in the hundreds of thousands kind of screaming back at him um you've got somebody here that says Michael Jackson reminder of his record best-selling thriller album of all time 120 million five best-selling albums of all time number one in the chart since he was 11 years old which is true um so most successful eyes of all time drake doing better of course and continue billboard tweeting this again feeding us drake chart success when people keep on asking for influence and impact cool so yeah 
I think in general, most people do think, you know, this obviously article is nonsense and obviously meant to generate debate, which is done. But again, like I said, um, if the consequence for this is we are meant to kind of uh, encourage to highlight and give flowers to people who, ex who are around nowadays making music, I think that's important. But again, we don't need to compare. We don't need to denigrate one to give props to the other. And we do need to kind of respect and um, and kind of recognize that the times that these other artists like the Beatles, like Michael Jackson, when they existed to make music and to become a superstar was incredibly diff was incredibly, I'd say, way more difficult than it is nowadays. Obviously, the competition and the kind of pull is way more saturated, so it makes it harder to break through. But if you do and you have the funds and you have the talent, it's far more easier to do so. I don't think anyone can kind of argue with that. So, you know. What, what can you do next on the list we have this interesting story crazy one that's kind of broken over social media this feud between karen civil and joiner lucas that then kind of spawned an entire debate around karen civil's alleged scammy ways and it also raised an interesting question around just the predatory and almost um Im embedded um f scammy nature of the music industry and the fact that no matter where you turn whether it's a white person a black person someone looks like you or doesn't look like you there's always somebody in the music industry willing and ready to rip you off if you give them the chance sometimes you don't have to even give them the chance they'll just do it anyway right and i think this Jonah lucas story is a clear example of it and they had a real back-to-back -back, i think on clubhouse i listened to a clip of it the other day and it was you know crazy to listen to someone like karen civil telling a Jonah lucas who she's allegedly um stole sixty thousand dollars worth of his money because she was meant to do some promotion for him or whatever for, you know get his career restarted again to for him to tell for her for her to tell him to simmer down or to relax or to not speak in some total tone if he generally feels aggrieved that he's missing he's, he, don't, he didn't get his money worth it's just crazy to me but anyway we continue Culture Hip Hop DX says Jonah Lucas launches Twitter onslaught against accusing Karen Civil of uh, stealing 60k. Um, it says he has seeming, seemingly triggered by the recent profile in Forbes magazine and legal spat with Wild and now co-star Jesse Wu. Jonah Lucas is trying is laying some serious allegations into his former business consultant Karen Civil. The independent MC launched a series of tweets on Saturday, September 18th, claiming he hired a live civil C no, sorry the live civil CEO for 60 grand circa 2014, long before he released his breakout singles um rose cappuccino and i'm not racist and the will remix the biological the biographical track that made will smith come out of rap retirement last year he says my son was on the way and you stole 60k from him before i got to oh yes yeah, before um, before i got in the game karen civil i hired you as a consultant and below attached was the memo you sent me i was desperate for help and you knew that after you was paid you went ghost and didn't expect me to pop here i am right um, after you got the money paid up front, you stopped answering my calls. Every time I hit you, you answered the phone with an attitude like I was messing up your day. I sent you hella messages pleading with you to do your job because my back was against the wall. You took advantage. Lucas made some claims in 2016, even cited Cameron's past beef with Karen Civil as a reason for reassuring him today. He says, at this time, I was afraid to speak for myself because I didn't want to get blackboard. I had no idea how this industry shit works and I, and I ain't want to drag my name um, through the mud. So out of fear, I stayed zipper face emoji until Cameron spoke up a few years ago on Twitter and then I did. As he dug up old text exchanges between um, the two accusers uh, and he accused having a media leverage, Karen Civil released a statement to the shade room explaining her version of events um she said it's easy to make broad statements when you aren't familiar with the back end of the business subcontractors are paid including referral agency local prs all parties contracted out on our behalf to execute or paid for from the budget allotted um his manager called me to rectify a situation after joining us made the first claims in which i said we can happily discuss after a public apology was made since he used the same platform to lie about money taken from him i recorded the call just for future circumstances like this what a scumbag anyway, unfortunately he is now utilizing the money to amplify and create social momentum around himself um he and i both separate had some separate conversation with Charlemagne the god this morning where he passed on his phone number so we can have a discussion directly but instead he took the social nothing was stolen or taken from you unfortunately certain artists are under the impression they have 24 access to you right crazy um uh, statement to make shortly after the statement was published Ryan Lucas ripped through the statements reverting back to the affirmation vacation as being the ultimate rap business betrayal a rare photo camera still were laughing at me on vacation with my money da, 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 da. so with this story the Joan Lucas story you could say it could be argued on one side of it that he was incredibly naive incredibly desperate um, 
incredibly trusting to believe that 60k would be enough to resurrect his career right because i guess he was going through a reinvention he was losing himself he said he had a kid um he was struggling to support his family and he was at that point where most creatives are where you have to figure do i have to quit this and get a real job or can i make this work for myself so he did a bit of a hail mary got the 60k and thought you know what i've got enough good work here because again i said before at the start of the show i think a lot of people don't focus enough on doing great work on putting in the hours on making content on producing album whatever it may be right um and feeding your fans they kind of focus more on the network inside of things and collaborations when really if you just focus on making great music and putting it out consistently a la ross you can use that to leverage yourself into other positions or kind of give yourself the platform or give yourself the possibility that when luck does come your way or when circumstances changes you have this whole catalog of amazing music people can go back to and reference so 60k is, in, is naive to expect that that's going to be enough to press the button i don't know how much karen civil can do for you in general i don't know how anyone could do for you for 60k that was naive there was also a part of naive that was maybe like there wasn't any deliverables any clear outlines about what was needed when and what monies from the 60k will be allocated to what it was just kind of vaguely put out there that the deliverables are going to be this this and this but there's no clear allocation about what money it was when it'll be de de delivered blah, blah 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 so of course that's a fault on his side but then on the other side of things there's a thought of like you know maybe it was his manager and karen that's another theory that's going out there maybe john lucas's manager and karen agreed behind the scenes like some artists do between themselves where they would say publicly that hey i'm gonna charge this for this for a feature but then they actually extract more money from the label and then don't actually declare what the real fee was and then bust down whatever is left between the both of them so there is a theory out there that exists that maybe john lucas's manager allegedly and karen civil maybe behind the scenes agreed to kind of split that money between the both of them and get that job done between both behind the scenes who knows but the other side of it could be that you know karen civil just took advantage of somebody that legitimately had their back against the wall and honestly thought that because of what she did with nipsey hustle um that maybe she could maybe recreate that magic and do that same thing with jonah lucas and it obviously didn't transpire that way but then this next account is a clear indication that karen civil is clearly some sort of scammer right it's clearly somebody that goes into business dealing sometimes with some bad intentions and it's interesting that the generally hip-hop media has been quite silent on this and they've refused to kind of weigh in and talk about it especially when you consider how vocal most of these people are when it came to the whole culture vulture situation when it came to denigrating and kind of putting out people like leo cohen and whatnot so again i'm sure is a net negative to the music industry at large i think that is at youtube but at least he's up front with his scumbag ways at least he's um in your face with how he's going to swindle you right and there's a track record of it too you can go back to a public track record and he doesn't try and change his ways he's completely still the same guy but when you kind of go into it under the guise that you're a good person in terms of current civil and you pretend like you want to help people out you pretend like you're in it for the good reasons for the right reasons but then you do exactly the same thing as the quote-unquote white man and then the media doesn't want to say anything because your skin color matches it kind of it kind of leaves a bit of a bad taste in my mouth i've got to be completely honest and again just in general the music industry because you're well liked will just ignore and turn a blind eye to a lot of things that you do and again that goes to show that for the most part you should never believe what you see on social media anyway just because someone presents itself one way it doesn't mean exactly what they're presenting is the, the reality of the situation and do you want a clear example of this this is another story from another person who had a very bad being his business dealing with karen civil relating to a charity um that they were putting together so this is a story courtesy of a lady called melissa prato and it says i want to join into the karen civil um conversation as a person who invited her to haiti for the first time in her adult life i don't know for her younger years through a non-profit organization for which she was signed to be an ambassador through which she tried to thoroughly profit so she gets brought on board to be an ambassador for a charity um in a native country of haiti and she then uses them as basically an opportunity to promote and advertise herself refuses to acknowledge the part that they played in getting her out there and bringing her on board as an ambassador and essentially finagles the entire situation um and basically scams them right allegedly from what this lady's saying so it's the following 
this, this, this kind of ran through this is okay so i'm reaching out to different people as potential brand ambassadors for so so seed i followed her on ig and i liked her image while well, that was what she perceived perception is reality i reached out to an industry friend asked about her and he's like yeah go for it so i tweet her she dms me her email i tell her what so a seed sa charity is all about i was excited because we're a group of haitian women she's haitian uh, quote unquote uh, volunteer volunteer based 100 percent profit goes to our program so at this point i feel like she aligns um the vision with our vision remember this is based off internet perception this is where i learned that you can literally be anyone you want to be online long story short so a seed team and her set up a skype call we tell her that we want to do a playground help and um, with the school in whatever this place is in haiti she's excited on board so at this point she's coming on as an ambassador right for this charity she's like yes let's do a first shoot to announce it i'll be in a met i'll be in miami blah 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 i coordinate the shoot she paid we do it so there's the shoot so far so good SAA Carrot Charity sent her the deck documentation presenting um, the project and budget. In the meantime, we are working on a look. We are working on our local contract for her um, as an ambassador. Things are moving along. Um, attached is another SOC program pick for context of the project we had. So, of course, a clearly great project in a country that needs all the help and assistance it can get. And of course, I'm sure the kids there would be happy to have it. So it continues. It says, so then she says, OK, let's do the groundbreaking of the playground in November 2014 for her birthday weekend. That should be a red flag. The fact that she wants to organize a charity event around her birthday weekend. But we continue. Um, she, will fl she will fly in with one person, a photographer, and we'll host her and coordinate everything. But again, she's an ambassador for SAS Charity. Weird that you're flying in a friend to go for a charity event, but we move. Um, so here we are. With all the SAS, SAS Charity on board, course planning this trip for her. In between visiting orphanages, schools where the playground is, we incorporated fun stuff, i.e. Wahoo, Manipur, Observation, gave us security, blended cars and full service. So as you can see, she's got full, you know, she's been looked after, she's swimming in great little oceans out there in Haiti and just enjoying life. So all of this is at the expense of the charity, right? So they're trying to make her feel as comfortable as she can. She only covered her flight and the 15000 for the groundbreaking. Um, we sent her the contract and the information for the first part of her payment, so-called 401k. The dates of to get closer to travel date, the 3rd to 7th. Now, the 401k isn't the amount, but it's just, I guess, what is called the industry term. Um, every time we talk about the first half of the payment, she gives us a runaround. Again, another red flag. Meanwhile, we're planning the. Uh, meanwhile, we're planning, and we've never been scammed, so we're riding off the good intent at this point. Still waiting for the first half of this four one k. Um, basically, her data, her date to travel arrives. At this point, the contract is signed, but no money out of the four one k has been sent. And in the back and forth, she had requested we print a big check for her photo op during the groundbreaking. Again, another red flag. Since we're used to honest people, we're still riding off good in point, good intent. She arrives to Haiti first. The red flag was that she she posted that she arrived in a jet and a limo when she arrived in an AA flight. So we're like, okay, this girl is all about the online perception and image. Still, no big deal. Uh, let me continue here, see if I can find it. Let's hope the thread continues. Uh... Oh, why is it there for? Why did the thread don't continue? Let's go back. Does not continue? Yeah, anyway, it doesn't matter. Effectively, the most egregious part of it, let's move on for that. The most egregious part of it, I think towards the end, is that Karen Civil allegedly goes to Haiti to promote, under the guise that she's going to be an ambassador for a charity, um, for obviously this playground that they're setting up, and they're going to do the groundbreaking event, which means, you know, when you get the shovel and you can't do the photo op, she's obviously going to be leading it, being a Haitian herself and having a big platform and a big profile. It's going to do wonders for the charity. It's going to put fans on people's faces, blah, blah, blah. She instead goes there and um with the sole intention of promoting her own thing which is the live civil thing and then she basically you know surprises them ambushes them on this photo shoot set and basically pulls out all these shirts to give all the kids they put them on the live civil shirts and then she promotes it on her social media feed like she's the one that organized that trip for herself and live civil kind of back this trip sort of thing oh yeah live civil went to haiti support these kids and kind of do this um, playground thing no mention at all of this sas charity and her being an ambassador it's more so no i'm the star this is my thing 
And then, of course, you know, that's a red flag. They get annoyed by it, but they kind of let her off because, again, they hope that she's going to do the other things. And then she kind of ends up flying back and doesn't do any of the things. And then she ends up not still paying. I'm not sure if she still paid the 41, the 401k or not. Um, I guess she has a wife. Maybe this woman's talking about it openly. But in general, what that story does go to prove in conclusion is that she's probably a scammer. Because, of course, she went into this deal with bad intentions. And that maybe the first story might have a lot more credence to it now because a lot of people were kind of not pouring scorn on Jordan Lucas's name, but were basically questioning his intelligence and his decision-making process to kind of trust somebody like a Karen Civil with 60K to turn his career around. That's too little to turn anyone's career around, especially somebody like Jonah Lucas. It doesn't necessarily, it wouldn't make the dent that he think it would make, even just, you know, I'd, I'd think a large chunk. Imagine if you just went to promote somebody on Facebook and Instagram. A lot of that money would disappear off a of paid ad instantly, right? So the fact that he thought that would be enough to kind of get his career restarted was naive. But it still remains that she kind of gave him the impression that she could do so that's why he believed and thought that and that she clearly didn't deliver on the promises that she made um clear, clear or not she didn't deliver on them and this story proves the fact that she probably is a scam artist but again it's interesting to see the lack of kind of backlash um when it comes to Karen Civil because again her skin color fits her profile fits she's got the right friends right connections the people are willing to turn a blind eye which again is more um, clear represent is more clear indication than you ever want of people's hypocrisy and people's lack of morals ethics backbone um, in general when it comes to situation because not everyone gets treated equally right people don't get treated equally some people's mistakes are okay to be forgiven and understand it understand un understandable whatever that word is right um some people are you know like i saw a video of Charmin the god saying he's sending good energy to her and stuff like why are you sending good energy to her like she's clearly somebody that's scamming artists that's doing wrong by people in the industry she's clearly made a career out of herself of pretending to be this one person that she clearly isn't and this person was white that you would be absolutely graving and ranting and raving on the radio about it and telling people not to sign deals and stuff and trust this and trust this person and we need to trust our own and da 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 well he tried to trust his own Jonah Lucas this charity tried to trust someone in their own community and look what happened so now you're wondering why these you know pale white people go to Africa and do these photo ops and you get angry about it but then you're not willing to get angry at the same level when Karen Civil is doing the exact same thing to her own people let alone right the white people you know those Rachel Dooley's going over to Africa and smiling you know um, around kids who have flies around them and pot bellies and stuff is gross don't get me wrong but still let's keep the same energy if you're gonna rip Rachel Dooley let's rip Karen Civil the same way but people don't people don't because they're full of shit basically but yeah what what, what else is new and then to kind of, I guess, kind of end it, a bit of sad news. Um, in conclusion of this story that kind of broke on social um, a couple of days ago, a very well-known or popular um, vlogger on YouTube known as Gabby Petito, uh, body was unfortunately found in Wyoming. And this is the headline, Gabby Petito, body found in Wyoming, missing van life blogger. This story broke because, um, you know, she's a popular van life blogger. If you don't know about van life, is where people basically uh, buy vans and repurpose them as living caravans or basically buy caravans and then go around the country wherever they live and basically rediscover, especially in America, it's more so about rediscovering um, parts of middle America and those kind of beautiful places around the South and whatnot and living a somewhat quasi alternative lifestyle, doing away with the idea of paying rent and a mortgage and kind of living out of your van because you're essentially able to do so because your career on youtube allows you to be a little bit more um location independent right and kind of embrace that vagabond-esque lifestyle and for most people that kind of wanderlust and that kind of living vicariously through other people resonates a lot when you see someone living a van life or doing the kind of travel vlogger thing so it's no surprise that a lot of these content creators especially if they look like her they're blonde blue-eyed pretty girls they're going to be very popular people are going to be fans of them and they're going to be concerned when they obviously they go missing and it kind of turns into this sort of tragic story so let's continue um it says here the fbi confirmed that the body found inside wyoming national park on sunday belonged to the remains of van life blogger gabby petito the coroner made the initial findings that her death was homicide but gave no indication as to how she died miss petito 22 was visiting the um, grand teto um, national park with her fiance brian laundry 
Police are currently searching for Mr. Laundry, whose whereabouts are unknown. He's considered a person of interest in the case, but has not been charged with any crimes. No details from the postmortem have been released. Tenton County Coroner Dr. Brent, um, Dr. Brent Blue confirmed the remains are those of Gabriel Venora Petito, born March 19, 1999. Coroner Blue's um, initial determination for the man of the death is homicide. The couple had been traveling for several weeks before Mr. Laundry returned home to Florida alone on September the 1st. He did not contact police or the, or the Petito family on his return. Major red flag, Mr. Petito's family reported her missing 10 days later. Several weeks later, earlier, the police in Utah town of Moab were caught to a possible domestic violence um, dispute which is the horrible part of it. Body cam footage showed Miss Petito crying and complaining about her mental health. A police report later said that Miss Laundry, Miss Laundry claimed Miss Petito had struck him during an altercation. No charges were filed. Um, with officers come recommended that the couple spend the night apart. What happened next is unclear. Mr. Laundry's family reported him missing um, over the weekend. They claimed that he left for a hike on September the 14th and never returned. The search for Mr. Laundry was focused on a 24,000-acre nat nature reserve near the home of the North Place, Florida. Police are using dogs, drones, and all train vehicles for the search, which police say is complicated by a difficult, swampy terrain. Additionally, police are investigating hundreds of reports signed to Mr. Laundry, including more than a dozen in Alabama, which borders Florida to the west. The case captivated the public, which is um, new development being becoming a focus of sleuth and platforms such as TikTok, Instagram, and Twitter. As of Tuesday, the hashtag Gabby Petito has reached more than 650 million views on TikTok alone, according to the Associated Press. So with all this attention, all this kind of insight and, you know, being put on a very popular white lady going missing of course there's naturally going to be some pushback against it which i'm going to talk about but some things to point out that really make this the story tragic is the fact that of course there's the incident that happened where somebody called in a domestic dispute i think there's a body cam footage of it that i actually watched the other day where essentially you have a video uh, a video of a police officer recording um the aftermath of an argument between gabby and her fiance um where she's shaking clearly visibly un vi clearly visibly mentally unwell and going through some sort of breakdown panic attack anxiety whatever it may be but obviously it's a remnants of a of a kind of you know a relationship uh, an argument between a couple um the police officer then tries to kind of get to the bottom of what occurred um it then transpires through that communication or through that you know conversation that allegedly gabby was the one that hit her fiance and for whatever reason the police officer starts coaxing the girl into answering questions a certain way in order for them not to write up the situation because i guess they don't want to because i guess most domestic situations don't end up in somebody's body getting found a couple of days later i don't know what the case was but they decided then kind of put them in separate cars and send them on their way right pretty crazy in the first part but understandable in some regard but the sad thing about it is that if it was the other way around and gabby's fiance was the one that hit her more often than not or more likely than not nine times out of ten he would have been arrested on the spot and he would have at least spend a night or maybe a few hours in jail just because he hit a woman but because it was a woman hitting a man they wanted to just you know be okay with it and put them in separate cars and send them on their way which maybe didn't happen and they probably didn't did end up kind of meeting up again maybe after the fact which we don't know we don't really show the details about but some of the reaction to this has been quite gross especially the oh um white missing white girl syndrome thing i don't really get it i don't understand why just because again she happened to capture the imaginations of people um maybe because she is a pretty white lady i'm not too sure that's that somehow is a reason the point to kind of denigrate her death um again you know i'm not sure what her family are going through having to have lived through this entire thing on social media and having again internet sleuth basically dig through and find out details about the story that police haven't been finding through that frustration all that stuff existing and then having another group of people saying that your child's life doesn't matter as much as you think it does and this person's life matters more it's just odd 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 behavior and if anything goes to show that a lot of these people that claim to be activists a lot of people that came to be change makers and stuff are just chatting shit for the most part they're just talking for social media likes and clout because at the end of the day if you really do think it's an issue and white girl syndrome is a thing or what missing white girl syndrome is a thing and the fact that maybe um people from underrepresented communities are not being highlighted in the news as much as they should when they go missing or murders whatever crimes it may be then why don't you use your platform or set up your own platform or your own channel where you highlight these cases that are going unreported there's plenty of them exist on youtube these kind of you know internet detectives who basically gained an interest in 
you know discovering the unearthed truths of crimes that happened in yesteryears who've built an entirely successful business doing so um you know again maybe helping along the way a certain family bring some closure to a certain event or explain something or honoring someone's life people do this quite often i, I follow a couple of youtubers i forgot their name is a there's a white girl that i follow that's really good at it who kind of you know goes through loads of kind of cold cases and basically sometimes can lead to you know opening up a case or maybe be the reason why a case got you know concluded in some way shape or form whatever it may be called but these people could go ahead and do that, but they don't. Instead, they just complain and point fingers from the outside and use one girl's deafness opportunity to say, but this one's girl deaf. It's just really gross. And this is an article from MSNBC that kind of touches on this point that I just yeah it just boggles the mind so it's a curse to msnbc it says yes the media is suffering from missing white girl syndrome and it's written by a guy called johanna jones it says since word of her disappearance broke early this month 22 year old gabby petito has become a household name thanks entirely to the american news media for the unaware petito's family first reported her missing september 11th after they'd been unable to reach her for several days authorities say she had been traveling to cross-country trip with her fiance um petito's family said she abruptly stopped replying to messages at the end of august and last week police in Moab, uh, Utah, released a video recording of the officer's body cam that showed Petito's destroyed after allegedly altercation with laundry. On Sunday, authorities announced they found a body. Details of Petito's disappearance have been shared fr frenetically online since she first reported missing. Some people have suggested the popularity of her story is due to her cinematic qualities, with some comparing her to a Lifetime movie and other times connected to the disappearance of the True Crime podcast. In reality, the data shows the popularity of the particular story is likely due to the way American media prioritizes missing people, not specific deals of the case. During a 2004 journalism conference, legendary news anchor Gwen Ifill coined the term missing white girl syndrome to underscore the news media's fascination with white girl who go missing black children go missing at a higher rate than white girls do than white kids do yet black children do, do who disappeared are given significantly less media attention than white ones racially disparity is missing person cases is an absolutely real phenomenon according to the evidence a 2015 study found that black children account for roughly 35 percent of missing children cases but there were only seven mentions seven percent of the time in media so a disproportionate okay cool let's go back to this stuff Coining it white girl, miss, missing white girl syndrome is odd because you're, I guess you're living in a country that's majority white. So why, I don't know, it just doesn't make sense. But what, but regardless, we continue. Um, black children go missing at a higher rate than white kids do. Okay, let's say if that kind of stat is true. Would it also be true to say that the majority of the people that are abducting these kids are probably black too? Does that get reported? Do you want that to be reported? Do you want it to be a narrative out there that exists that there are hordes of black people going around and abducting children, you know, getting them into, you know, what sex work and all that stuff like or no, you probably don't. It continues. Yeah, but you know, disappear are given significantly less media attention than white ones. And if that's the case, again, like I said, start your own media platform and bring light to those situations. Right. That should be the way to go around it. Again, these things sound like right wing talking points, which is not meant to be. But I just generally never understood this need to use someone's tragedy as an opportunity to remind everybody about your tragedy. It's sort of like oppression, no, it's sort of like suffering Olympics, right? Like one family is suffering the loss of their darling daughter who had built a pretty successful YouTube channel for herself and had captured the hearts of many people by posting these vlogs online because maybe people saw a lot of themselves in her. I don't know why, whatever, who cares? They're going through that heartache of missing and obviously not being able to see that person again. And then now you're using this opportunity to remind everybody of another tragedy, of another family that also is missing a child, a family member, a relative that they haven't seen in ages too. It's just completely disgusting. We continue. Outlets that choose to amplify stories of white disappearances more than black ones which occur at a disproportional higher rate are implying that black lives matter less than white ones. No, they're not. They're just reporting on stuff that people want to see. I'd assume so, right? Um, if the majority of your audience are watching the new channels are white, they probably want to see people that look like them going through the stuff that they go through. Now, the problem here is that the right wing talking point would be, if you're going to say this, then you have to report with the same sort of, um, the same sort of oomph, the murders that occur in places like Chicago and stuff, right? Which are generally done by, you know, other black people. Um, especially the high prevalence of gun, you know, of gun violence that occurs over there. Again, the stuff is not necessarily again because somebody's lost a family member, a daughter, a sister, a friend. 
But I don't know. I just don't see how this does anything. This doesn't help. This doesn't make things better. If anything, this makes people hate you more. Um, and anything that you're trying to represent. And the suggestion that Black Lives Matter less than white ones was in pictures for movements like Black Lives Matter. Activists who have raised the point during the Petito search have been able to shed light on cases of missing black people that had previously been widely unknown, including disappearance of a Danny Robinson in the Arizona desert last summer. But again, that's a problem. Were well, you talking about this last summer? That's the issue, right? And the article here from Qatar, it's not an article from MSNBC. Were well, you highlighting the Danny represent the missing the the disappearance of Danny Robinson from Arizona this summer? Were well, you doing it? Probably not. Um, is it responsibility of these major news platforms to relay and sort of broadcast every single crime that's occurring in in your parts of your community? Probably not. It's completely unrealistic. I'm sure there are many other crimes in white neighborhoods that still go unreported because you just can't get around to them. So to expect that they're going to shine a light on a group of on a kind of on a, on a part of the population, especially people like who are writing articles like this who are hell bent on trying to embarrass said network and stuff it just doesn't i don't know this doesn't necessarily seem like something that you'd want to pick up and again i'd much rather want my story told by people that look like me anyway when it comes to kind of recent disappearance and stuff who kind of have a vested interest in trying to look out for people that look like the looked like me and come from the places i come from as opposed to these major news networks that's what i would say but again what do i know and then here's, of course, a video of Joy and Reed speaking about it. And it says, after Joy and Reed mentioned Robinson's treatment in the missing white people during the Monday show, some writers took exception to her um, use of I feel's missing white syndrome phrase. These people are conflicting, uh, conflating media criticism, which Joy offered, with criticism of Petito, which Joy did not offer. These outlets looking at you, Fox News, would better saved, would better serve, so analyzing their own dis dispersions of race coverage rather um then feigning outrage petito went missing she's white she's a woman and yes our collective obsession with people who felt that description to occlusion but others reveal a sickness of american culture there's no real kind of like um r.i.p or condolences to the family and stuff it's just kind of very coldly written a lack of emotion a lack of empathy a lack of understanding which is weird because i guess these people are mostly would say they're kind of left meaning but they seem to be the most um callous in it when it comes to dealing with this kind of thing which i get maybe because you've had to put up with so much friction and you know kind of combativeness from the people on the right that you kind of want to stick it to them but this clearly or this shouldn't be the way to go about things i would hope so but again what do i know um, i'm not going to play the clip because joy and reed sucks or joy reed sucks in general but i just i don't know man i just think this whole thing is sad i think it's sad when anyone goes missing especially when family members say the person is very communicative and kind of has a great relationship with their family members and friends there's no someone is suffering you know from a lack of friendships a lack of connections or isn't going through depression or whatever and they just go missing out of the blue you know more than likely there's something bad went on and it's not going to end well especially when it goes over 20 was it 40 hours or whatever it may be usually that kind of increases the chance that this person isn't going to be found alive so a tragic story the other part that's tragic and something that i didn't really know could happen in the united states so allegedly i guess because he had him in charge but supposedly the story goes that um gabriel petito's fiance um returns back home without her even though they left together and for whatever reason he hires he hires a very high-powered lawyer straight away um who can who kind of was able to kind of get him in a position where he doesn't need to answer questions from the police they ask him questions he refuses to answer no comment under the guise that he says oh um the narrative has already been painted that i'm the one that's the guilty one so anything i say will obviously be used against me and i'd rather not say anything until charges i guess until charges are formally been brought against me but i didn't know with somebody potentially missing in this case and potentially murdered which of course we learned that she was that you could get away with just saying no comment and you'd be fine but i guess you have to be charged first i guess that's the, the difference until you're charged um you probably should say no comment which is why they tell you if you get arrested especially in the states or anywhere in general you should just ask for your lawyer straight away before you answer any question and if they do ask you any questions just keep saying lawyer 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 until you're able to kind of um get your story straight and work out strategy with your legal representation in order to fight the case that you're fighting but i thought that was just mad that you could do that in general um of course tragic story um, tragic circumstances more likely than not that fiance guy is probably dead himself right he probably self-expired let's be let's call a spade a spade there um you don't go on hikes after reportedly your fiance again like what kind of this again parents in general man the 
it just must be so difficult, right, to kind of go through that situation because your son comes back home. He's clearly in some sort of state. There's clearly something that has gone on between, you know, um, your daughter-in-law to be who isn't who didn't come back with him, even though they're self together. Um, you're not too sure if things are correct or right. He then tells you he wants to go on the hike to clear his head. You know deep down it's not the right decision to let him out of that door because you're you're sure that you won't see him again because he's either going to end up dead somewhere or he's going to be in the back of a police car and you won't see him until he's, he appears in court. So you know in your guts telling you, every fiber of your being is telling you not to let your, cut, your, your son go out of that door and go on that hike, but you do it anyway because what else are you going to do? You can't force him to stay indoors. You love the kid. It just puts him in such an uncomfortable and uncertain situation. Because I'm sure there's some people out there going to be blaming the flipping parents for this. But I don't think they could have done anything more. The police officers, could they have maybe arrested them and maybe kind of avoided this inevitability? Possibly. But again, what are they to do? The facts are the facts. We do treat women differently when they hit men as opposed to when men hit women. It just is the facts. So because of that, the police officer had no inclination or intention or reason to arrest the girl for hitting him because why would she why would he do you know what I mean like society has told him that the thing that's actually dangerous is men hitting women not women hitting women not women hitting men and maybe just the, I don't know it, so I don't think anyone should be blamed it's a tragic story all in I think the 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 way of kind of this whole approach of bringing up the white white missing white woman syndrome thing is super disgusting and super callous and lacking in empathy and emotion lacking empathy and sympathy and just generally speaks to this kind of you know divided world that we live in at the moment where people just are unwilling to kind of understand the pains that everyone's kind of going through man do you know what I mean it's mad it's I don't know it's mad it's mad it's mad but yeah R.I.P. Gabby Petito for some feeling go out to her family and friends I'm sure people that viewed her will miss her dearly and all that malarkey and hopefully this an opportunity again to highlight some cases of people missing from unrepresented communities and if you are somebody that is in a position to start something a blog an instagram page a youtube channel a podcast where you're highlighting these cases do so because your voice is necessary because clearly people are hurting out there they want to hear their stories and their pains to be represented in media and if you can do it do it but for the activists is complaining who aren't, aren't doing anything themselves you can go jump off a cliff do you know what I mean? you can go jump off a cliff especially if your um bullets are being pointed towards the family of a family that are going through such a tragic event yeah i mean that's not that's not on but hey what do i know anyway that's actually the show episode number 499 thanks so much for tuning in it's been a pleasure to have your company um if it's your first time checking out the show via youtube you know what to do smash like hit subscribe leave me a comment down below if you're listening for the podcast that please give me a five five star review and of course any other review for three two one i'll be greatly appreciative maybe yeah, one yeah um, and of course support via patreon is welcome too you can click the um, description and find the link in there and i'll be posting up a very um, x-rated version of my review of the event i went to featuring armin dixon a tough manner so if you want to check that out make sure you check out my patreon at patreon.com for just agostino that's patreon.com for just a-g-o-s-t-i-n-h-o um until then i'll see you guys very very soon this is actually the show episode number 499 take care be safe and sayonara <laughs>